The jury in the synagogue mass shooting trial is going home for the evening. They've been deliberating since shortly after 9 this morning. It's up to them to decide whether Robert Bowers spends the rest of his life in prison or will face the death penalty. Thanks for joining us here on KDKA TV News. I'm Christine Sorensen. I'm Ken Rice. This is, of course, the third and final stage of the trial of Robert Bowers. KDKA lead investigator Andy Sheehan has been at the courthouse all day. He joins us now live with an update. Andy. Well, Ken, the jury will need a second day to decide whether Robert Bowers faces the death penalty, weighing the evidence for and against. The death penalty is reserved for the worst of the worst of crimes, and the massacre at the synagogue easily qualifies. But this case has never been about Bowers' guilt or innocence. Rather, the two sides have spent most of the past two months arguing over his mental state. Was he driven by pure anti-Semitic hate, as the prosecution contends, or was he in the throes of a psychotic delusion when he murdered 11 innocent victims and shot five others, including three police officers? The jury must weigh and balance the evidence. To that end, the jury is required to consider the reasons that call for the death penalty and need to vote on these so-called aggravating factors, that Bowers murdered 11 innocent and defenseless victims, that he was motivated by religious hate, that he has shown no remorse for the atrocity. But they also must vote on 115 so-called mitigating factors forwarded by the defense. These would be reasons for leniency, including Bowers' tortured childhood of verbal and physical abuse, multiple suicide attempts, and a diagnosis of schizophrenia. The jury got the case at 9.30 this morning and about an hour into deliberations, they requested to view the weapons used in the assault, Bowers' AR-15 rifle and three Glock handguns. The members processed past the weapons in the courtroom, then returned to the jury room to resume deliberations. Later, they asked to see a chart detailing the mental health history of Bowers' extended family. They were told they already had access to that chart. Now, the jury just left the courthouse a little while ago, and they will return here at 9 a.m. tomorrow morning and continue their deliberations. Obviously, a very weighty decision to decide whether somebody lives or dies. Reporting live at the U.S. Courthouse downtown, Andy Sheehan, KDK News. All right, and joining us live now is local attorney Ken Haber. During his 25-year career, he's been involved in many death penalty cases. Ken, thanks very much for joining us. Appreciate having you here. Thank so you. tell us, in terms of the jury right now, explain how they have to decide unanimously if it's death, but not necessarily if it could be life. Also explain what happens. Well, for there to be a verdict, it has to be unanimous. Um, that's under federal law. So all 12 jurors have to uh, agree uh, either that the appropriate verdict is death or the appropriate verdict is life. Uh, there can be a split and then there would be no, no verdict. It would, it, would be, uh, it, it would be resolved with a life sentence at that point. So it defaults to a life sentence if there is no verdict. Is that a hung jury? Is that what that's called? Y yes, um, uh, unless all 12 agree that the appropriate verdict uh, should be death, mm -hmm. then it will be a life sentence. Okay. So I think there's been uh, a, a perception, a belief by some that perhaps the jury would just go in and take a vote, life or death. That's not the case at all. This is a 26 page verdict form that the jury has to fill out, filled with aggravating factors, mitigating factors. Explain what the jury has to do with these. They have a lot of work to do, probably explains in large part why it's taking so long, mm -hmm. although I wouldn't say that. Uh, one day is, is a long time given what is at stake here, uh, but there's 115 mitigating circumstances that the uh, defense has raised and has asked the jury to find. Um, essentially, those factors could range from uh, mental health history uh, uh, to uh, one of the mitigators is that uh, his mother loves him or his uncle um, is praying for him. Um, so all of those have to be uh, discussed or voted on. Uh, by each of the 12 jurors, and then they also have to look at what the government has alleged as aggravating circumstances, things that make the crime uh, much worse than, than the average crime, or the way it's uh, often referred to, the worst of the worst. Uh, the government has contended there's nine aggravating circumstances here from uh, multiple victims, vulnerable victims, um, lack of remorse, and, and, and six others.
A couple of questions uh, asked by the jury today. Almost immediately, they asked to see the weapons that were used, and they were allowed to do so. And then a little bit later, there was a question about uh, they wanted to see some evidence that had been introduced earlier regarding uh, the defendant's family's mental health history. Is there anything to be gleaned from either of those questions? So I think whenever the jury asks a question, uh, you have to be careful not to attach too much importance or not to speculate too much uh, based on what the question is. It could be that one juror is caught up on that issue or that fact. Uh, it could be that all 12 uh, want to know. Um, in this particular uh, case, uh, the first question is, is uh, it's tough to know what they were really look, looking for, uh, to want to look at the firearms. Um, the second question is more intriguing to me. Uh, the second question, after uh, uh, at least, what, three or four, if not five hours of deliberation, uh, uh, was about um, the uh, defendant's mental health history and his family history of yes. mental health. Yes. You know, that, that tells me that, um, at, a, at the very least, some jurors, if not all of them, uh, really want to um, learn as much as they can about that, and they're attaching importance to it. That doesn't necessarily mean that, that, that the verdict is, is going to go one way or the other. It just means that, that they're doing their job and they're, and, and they're taking this very seriously. Yeah, okay. clearly. All right, Ken, thank you so much for your insight. I know we'll be talking with you a lot more over the next day or so. Thank you. All right, Ken Haber, thanks. All right, uh, in the meantime, we want to remind you free resources remain available to anyone experiencing trauma related to the trial. You can call the Pittsburgh Crisis Hotline or contact the 1027 Healing Partnership.